Hello, Reddit. Uh, my name is Penn Gillette. This is my partner, Teller. We're Penn and Teller. We've been looking forward to doing this for a while. We heard they got um, uh, like 2,000 questions, and they've picked 10. So the 10 out of the 2,000 should be really fiercely good, wouldn't you think? Let's hope they are. And uh, I want to tell you that we have our show is coming up on the Disco Channel, the Discovery Channel, which we call Disco. It's called Tell a Lie. It's right after Mythbusters on Wednesday night, Wednesday night at 10 on the Discovery Channel, Penn and Teller, Tell a Lie. It's our new show, and for those of you who liked uh, Penn and Teller Fool Us or Penn and Teller Bull****, it has the same first three words in the title, Penn and Teller. Let's get to the questions. Question number one is from Church, C-H-Y-R-C-H. I remember an interview discussing bull****. You guys mentioned that the last episode should be about the bullshit of bullshit. Since it is unlikely the show will return, not impossible, but unlikely, I'll give them that. Uh, can you give us a few examples of what would be in that episode? Well, we wanted to start out in a general, then there's these you know, who are these people to answer political and science questions? You've got... Um, Carney dirt, carney trash, finished high school on a plea bargain. Um, you know, no education whatsoever except for clown college. You've got Teller, who does have a higher education from Amherst College in the classics, in Latin and Greek. He was a high school Latin teacher. So you've got two half magicians, uh, one of whom no college at all, the other one college totally out of the sciences. What are we doing talking about that? Then we're going to go through all 87 shows and find the mistakes we made, both you know logically and factually, and just rip it apart. Now, that's always a pipe dream. I mean, very rarely. I guess the show House and the Bob Newhart show and a few other shows have known their last show was coming well before they did their last show. But on a show like Bull****, you know, we, we, we could have done another season, but we wanted to go over and do Tell a Lie for the Discovery Channel, so we kind of left that there. And I'd love to do a show just ripping us apart and also do a show ripping apart things we believe really strongly. We're both followers of Ayn Rand, and that's easy to rip apart. She said a lot of crazy and there's a lot of cult stuff that's nutty there. Love to rip that apart. Love to rip apart libertarianism. Love to rip apart atheism. Love to rip apart modern art and modern music, 12-tone music, and some free jazz. All the stuff that we love, we would love to have a chance to uh, rip apart. So um, that's some of the stuff that's going to be on this show. But we also, we didn't do the work because we weren't going to do the show. If we ever do the show, we'll do the work. Now here's the second question. Uh... Puposaurus Rex. This is Puposaurus Rex. Um, has a trick ever gone horribly wrong on stage to the point where you couldn't recover? Has a trick ever gone horribly wrong without the audience having the slightest clue? Uh, Teller's fond of saying that magic is binary. It's either or. You don't have a magic trick that kind of fools you. It's a, it's a house of cards, and if the whole thing doesn't fool you, you might as well not do it. Um, we also do stuff that's supposed to look dangerous. We point guns at each other, put nail guns through my hands, tell their swallows needles. So there is a moral and artistic and self-preservation reason to not have things screw up. Uh, there's been some bragging lately. You know, um, David Blaine and uh, 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 Chris Angel do this bragging stuff about discomfort, bragging stuff about being hurt. You know, I used to do card tricks, now I hang my fish hooks by my d you know. I used to do card tricks, now coincidentally I can hold my breath longer than anyone in the world because I used to do card tricks. <laughs> I don't know. I'm in a box with my own d and I'm either eating or not eating depending on what country I'm in. Uh, uh, my idea about that is that when especially your classic nerd covers himself with 
rubber cement and runs around saying he's a horrible burn victim, which was certainly your whole junior high experience and a lot of mine. That is not, no matter what Hillary Clinton says, uh, the video games that celebrate uh, that kind of excitement are not celebrating death. They're not celebrating pain. They're celebrating health. You rip that uh, rubber cement off and you're okay and you're healthy and you're feeling fine. What makes the stuff beautiful is the fact that it is a trick. It's it's not beautiful if it's real. If you're really in a box full of your own that's not beautiful unless you're going to the moon, you know, unless you're doing something during it. It's not beautiful. Pointing guns, shooting them in each other's face after they've been signed and the audience knowing that's completely safe, that's where the beauty is. What you want out of art, what you want out of life, what you want out of sex is for the visceral and the intellectual to collide as fast as they can. When you're on a roller coaster, your guts tell you we're going to die. Your intellect tells you if everybody died, their insurance rates would be too high. They couldn't run. They couldn't keep the park open. So that's what you're trying to do. So with our stuff, if we were doing stand-up comedy, you can have stuff that kind of works and keep it getting better. But if you're doing stuff that's supposed to look dangerous, it's very important that in our entire career we've never been hurt. I mean, sprained ankles, little cuts, discomfort. I mean, the leeches were horrible. The bees were horrible. But nothing life-threatening. You know, if you want life-threatening, don't go to a magician. Don't even go to Chris Angel or David Blank. Go to, like, NASCAR or something. There are places where people get hurt, and I avoid them. I don't want nothing to do with that. I want it to be a celebration of that. All of that having been said, uh, there's nothing we've tried that we haven't up. <laughs> we try to make sure we don't up enough that people are injured. Not us, not our crew, not the audience. But we make uh, we make very big mistakes, and we've had uh, we've had the one where we put Teller in the water tank uh, and he drowns. We've had that uh, just cancel. We've had that when I looked backstage, did the introduction, you were supposed to wheel out, you didn't wheel out, I was out there talking about what was in the news, and then Teller came out and did the next bit. We had another time with the water tank where there was a crack in it, and as he's supposed to be drowning, the water was just coming down like this, so he's no longer going to be within the fiction of this drowning. So we had a crew guy, he's doing a bucket brigade, pouring water in on top which kind of made the whole make-believe very, very complicated. There was one time that I was on top of a mirrored platform doing a routine and uh, really selling it. It was a great, great trick. There was a mirror platform. You thought you were seeing under it. You couldn't. One of the best use of mirrors ever. I dropped a prop, walked out behind it, and gave away the whole trick, boom, instantly. So yes, we make mistakes, but we will never make mistakes where we get hurt. I think that's all I want to say on that. But things go horribly wrong. And as far as, I don't think we've ever had a show where we felt everything went right. We're happy with them. But you're always trying to get them a little better. As Michael Goudeau, our writer on Tell a Lie, um, said, uh, a, uh, doing the variety acts is for people who watch the movie Groundhog Day and think it looks like a great thing uh, to live that way. Uh, Star Vixen, on your show, Bull****, was there ever a segment that you regretted doing? whether because of backlash or because of your own personal beliefs. Was there a segment you did that opened up doors to new interests, hobbies, or causes? Thank you. Well, thank you for saying thank you, Star Vixen. Um, yeah, I regretted doing the hypnotism show because I thought it was a bad show. I thought that uh, we didn't really have a strong point. We didn't, we weren't incorrect what we ended up doing was so mushy. And we pushed hard to do the hypnotism show, and that was a mistake because it wasn't a good show. Uh, there were filler shows we did. The show on breasts, as much as I love breasts, we had nothing to say there. The show on hair was a very good show, but it had nothing to say. About every season we would do, for budget reasons, one or two weak ones that weren't really political. And um, I think, without exception, I disliked those. Uh, I think the worst show we did was the, uh, the good old days where we kind of made fun of people who, uh, we, uh, we didn't want to, but we had to, to get our show out, uh, make fun of people who were just obsessed and people who are obsessed are, are our favorite people. Um, there is no scientific, uh, point, philosophical point or 
that we made that uh, I think is wrong now? Uh, no. Everybody brings up secondhand smoke, but that's not true. What we said on the secondhand smoke show was that the government should not be part of regulating it and that the studies at that time weren't conclusive. There then were studies afterwards that showed a lot more of that, but we weren't actually wrong. And what we've tried to do is we've tried to pretend we had one we were really wrong on. But if you watch the show... You may disagree with us politically, but I don't think we're wrong scientifically, although the spirit was a little wrong on that, the, the feeling, the heart on that was. Uh, I, I don't think I got, uh, I got into any new interests uh, or hobbies or causes from any of them. I mean, I, I was already, the ones where you see us get real excited, like Norman Borlaug and the Green Revolution and uh, all the stuff we do on the world getting better, and the stuff on disagreeing with the Bible and Mother Teresa were all things we brought to the show. You know, um, uh, there's a misconception because other shows are like this. Most other shows have producers and writers, and then they have meat puppets, on-air talent, that just kind of read what happens. And I think in that case, you can have a lot of stuff to learn. But we were the producers. We were the writers. We worked on it from the beginning, so it's very hard to su surprise yourself. I'm not saying we did it all ourselves. We had wonderful researchers, wonderful producers, uh, directors, writers, all that stuff. But we were kind of in the trenches, so we're not going to be that surprised by things. Although I will say the PETA show, um, we knew PETA was a f***ed up organization. But man, the stuff we found on PETA was so much heavier than we thought. Uh, this is uh, The next question is from Perm... Permutation. What was the most drastic shift in personal belief while researching a topic for bull****? That's the same question. It's the same question with different words. Um, probably the most drastic shift for me was, uh, I don't even know. Uh, I would say hypnotism, uh, except, uh, I, you know, I wanted to say that all hypnotism was just bull****. That's what we wanted to do on that show. And it's just not true. And that made us do a lot of weasel words and mix in there. Um, was it? Recycling, uh, I also didn't expect, but that's all in the direction you wouldn't think. I mean, recycling, we started out with recycling as bull****. But I, that came out of that New York Times article I read, and a lot of the stuff that was heavy in there I'd already read when we came to it. So I think it's the same kind of answer. It's not that we're not open-minded. It's just that we're working on it, so our opinions don't change when we do the show. They change when we're working on the show, which I guess you could have asked that, but okay. Um, G. Julius Caesar, which performance on Fool Us had you most perplexed? Um, Although we figured it out when the camera was off us, the, uh, the act that was done with them serving uh, dinner, the uh, three plates and the people from the audience, um, knowing that those people weren't set up in advance, which we did know, um, made it very, very perplexed. What's the guy's name? I just blanked on it. Oh, it's horrible because I just talked to a friend of his at our show too. Uh, there was a thing where they brought up three members of the audience, had them uh, write their names, name tags. They had meals in front of them, and all of it was predicted, although they made choices. It was really, really wonderful. And then the card tricks, um, the one that they, they the, the guy did where the card, my signed card was sealed in a deck, um, uh, was really, really perplexing. I think the answer is that... Um, <laughs> Of the nine people that fooled us, I think that eight of them had us deeply perplexed, and one of them might have been a little bit of a weasel call. But um, we were uh, we were very perplexed by this stuff. There's really no hype or jive on Fool Us. Uh, we are out there. We don't see the rehearsals. We don't know who's going to be on. We know what trick they're going to do. We get no help. We sit there. We got a couple of minutes, and we do our level best. And uh, uh, there's even great acts like Piff the Magic Dragon that we wanted to fool us so that we could come to um, we could come to Vegas because we love them. Uh, we didn't cheat at all. If anybody that we said we were perplexed by, we were perplexed by with a couple of 
uh, with a couple of exceptions where it's just because there's a nebulous area of ruling where it wasn't quite as satisfying as some of the others. But for the most part, we were fooled by the stuff we were fooled by. Let's see what uh, Raktoris, would you say Raktoris? Mm -hmm. Have you ever not been able to master a trick, as in you knew the specifics, but couldn't perform it because it was too hard or quick or something along those lines. Um, as I've gotten older, um, my thumbs have been getting bad. I don't know whether it's hereditary or whether it's because of overuse, lots of lots of juggling, um, uh, lots of juggling and lots of sleight of hand. But sometimes I don't have a radius uh, on my thumbs that I'd like to have. So there's been a couple of, uh, I'm very interested in card stuff, and we've been doing less card stuff, possibly because we're playing bigger theaters, possibly because we have less interest. Uh, I don't know Teller's reasons, but my reasons are I just can't use my hands the way I used to. I also am practicing juggling less because I, I can't use my hands the way I used to. And Teller's not comfortable hanging upside down as much as he used to be or sliding around. That's just simply getting older and, um, and slower. Um, but the real question... Well, I was going to get to that. The real question is uh, uh, we don't usually work on stuff where uh, the trick gets accomplished by uh, real borderline razor edge skill. As a matter of fact, nobody who does stage stuff is really on the edge there. You simply can't be. Uh, to have this explained, read Steve Martin's book, Born Standing Up. He has a whole paragraph in there about how it's easy to be great, it's hard to be good. Uh, that explains this very well. We've got to be good every night. So it can't be on that razor's edge. We can't have the one thing we're able to do one night out of ten. We have to be able to do it all the time. So most of our stuff that we fail at, we fail at before it gets there. And we put a lot of money. We had this great idea of Teller walking on water. It was a beautiful, not the job, the jive swimming pool or lake, lake thing where you can see the I mean does fools nobody I mean there's one person going I wonder how he did that but nobody gets fooled by that but it's up on YouTube you can see other magicians you know walking on water and it's totally jive I mean, it's really like you know sixth grade magic kid stuff but we want to do something hipper than that we want to take a really powerful fire hose we wanted to turn it off, then turn it across, shoot it across the stage, and then have Teller step up on it. And just standing on there, kind of surfing on this, uh, walking on water. And we loved the fact that it was a uh, biblical illusion, but brought up into not exactly what you expect. Not walk, I mean, when they see the, oh, the man, this stuff's so sucky. But when you, not walking on water like that, but really walking on water in a dynamic and loud and the hose was beautiful. And we actually had not just one way to do it. We had two ways of doing it. They were both pretty close. They seemed pretty close. And uh, they never looked good. But they were looked like they could look good if we kept working on them. Because the way we work on stuff is really, we work, there's this thing we're doing where we're dressing a cow up like an elephant and vanishing it surrounded by the audience. We've been working on it three years now at like 100000 bucks. The sawing we do in the show, that was a couple years and a ton of money. Uh, we worked in the bullet catch for two years all the time. Was it longer than two? Yeah, about two, maybe a year and a half. And... Every day, you know, working on that thing. We, we work on a long time. But this, this, this water thing, we never got to fail at the trick because we failed at the getting the water on stage. The problem is running a fire hose that doesn't look wimpy. You know, you don't want to do a, like what they do on the, like the kiddie pool with plexi under it that he's walking across. Oh, I'm so heavy. I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus. Oh, uh, we don't want to do that. We wanted to do like a big stream of water. Powerful. And the big stream of water was ruining the stage and ruining the lights. And we could not control the water. And if you put it in a plexi uh, tube, you've destroyed the whole trick because then the audience can't see it. So it had to be this huge flow of water that would aerate and you could feel and breathe and smell in the theater and kind of feel it getting humid. And it had to be loud, just so loud I couldn't talk. 
It had to be all those things. We got that from a hose and got that from the trick, but if we had done it like 10 nights, we would have ruined the theater. And so uh, they wouldn't allow us to do it. And of course, we wouldn't do it anyway. It's our theater. Uh, but it was the same problem with the world's biggest card trick where we had uh, forklifts shuffling tons of cards. We did over at Bally's, but we did it at Bally's by putting down, was it a three-quarter inch? Three-quarter inch steel plates and welding them together, and it ruined our feet, ruined the audience members, it slipped around, and you just can't have the weight on the stage. So the problem is, you know, when other magicians build stages for themselves, they want to build them with trap doors, <laughs> and they want to build them with easy escape routes up, up and down. If we got to build our theater from scratch, we'd want to build it waterproof with a lot of troughs, and we want to build it with a lot of heavy stuff so we could bring heavy machinery and water on stage. But I would call our walking on water a complete and utter failure. Uh, it cost us a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of heartbreak, and we failed. Um, um, seven by... Uh, G.C. Mandrake, or would you say G.C. Mandrake? Would you say? In Penn's book, God Know, Penn's book, God Know, Signs You May Already Be an Atheist and Other Magical Tales. Um, looks like this. Um, in Penn's book, he states that outside of a professional context, he and Teller almost never socialize. Has this always been the case? Uh, did you do more non-work related things together when you first started as a double act? Is it just you get burned out from being together so much of the time? Well, you know, uh, when we first started out, there wasn't a choice. We first started out, we were doing Renaissance festivals and fairs. Uh, we lived together. We lived together in an apartment. We drove together in our Datsun 210 station wagon with all the props in the back. We stayed in, uh, we shared Motel 6. We shared rooms together. If one of us wanted to um, have sex, the other one had to walk around the parking lot. I mean, that's what, that's what we would do, just walk around the parking lot for the amount of time it took for sex to happen. And uh, sex sometimes, you know, can take minutes. Um, walking around the parking lot. You know, you're in, like, Georgia, and you're walking around a parking lot doing nothing. Or you try to walk all the way to the supermarket get some G's, walk all the way back. Because sometimes the sex involved having to take the car to go out and find the sex. That was part of the, if the sex was just, then the other person could have the car. But if there's there's prowling involved, uh, which there sometimes was for both of us, then you gotta take the car and the other guy's just sitting in the parking lot of the Motel 6 in dog <laughs> Indiana. We lived through that. Um, and we were in the car together uh, all day. We'd drive to the gig, we'd do the gig, we'd do the setup, we'd do all the interviews together. We were together all the time. But that's not really the issue. We didn't really get sick of each other. Um, I believe that the volatile groups, um, uh, Lennon and McCartney, Martin and Lewis, Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, you don't have teams nowadays. We have to go back in time. But um, Martin and Lewis, and especially Lennon and McCartney, those two groups, um, were love affairs. Those were two people who fell in love. Mart, uh, Lennon and McCartney was certainly in love. And then when things start to not go right, uh, love is heartbreaking. Teller and I started without any natural affection at all. I didn't have that. You know that feeling you have of wanting to hug somebody or wanting to be around them or really feel affectionate toward them, which I feel towards a lot of people. I never felt toward Teller. Our uh, relationship was essentially uh, an email relationship before... Uh, before email. It was very, very um, sterile, very, uh, very uh, cold. Uh, but the information was very important. And we agreed on all the important stuff. And we also uh, disagreed on stuff of how art was put together. And there was these intellectual ideas Teller had about how magic should be an intellectual form. I hated magic. I wanted nothing to do with magic. But Teller said it was supposed to be intellectual. Um, uh, it was built in irony. The more you knew about the world, the more powerful it was. It wasn't a, a kid's form, and it wasn't a form for a greasy guy in a tux with a lot of birds torturing women in front of Mylar to bad, small, white boy rip-off Motown music. It could be something else. And that conversation went on. And I felt from the moment I met Teller, from the moment uh, I had the first conversation with him, I was still in high school. He was a high school teacher, different high schools. Our age, our age difference, we're now the same age. When we were younger, we were a different age, uh, seven years between us.
which doesn't matter now, did matter then. Because when you're 17, 18, and your business partner is 25, that's, that's a big spread. And uh, he had so much to teach me. There was so much to learn. There were so many different ideas. It was just this constant conversation. And very intellectual, very sterile, very non-emotional. We were respectful of each other. We got along great. I don't think that many people could live like we did you know, we lived 24 hours a day together. I mean, we slept in beds next to each other in the Motel 6. We sat next to each other and drove. We did all our shows together. There, We would very rarely see anyone else. We were just traveling, the two of us, and, you know, that was it. But it was built on respect, and um, respect is more important than love. Uh, if you think, I've always believed that what I did with Teller was better than what I do alone. And um, we're like two guys that run a dry cleaning shop or something. And we don't get along. It's not bad at all. We kind of assume we're not going to get along. We're business partners. So the guy who cleans the slurping machine pisses you off. So what? He cleans the slurping machine. You deal with it, you know. Um, but all of that having been said, and all those answers we give flippantly, uh, over all these years, I mean, he's certainly my closest friend. I mean, there's no, no doubt about that. Uh, but all that's in spite of all the affection and stuff. It's time and it's respect. Uh, and, you know, when, my, uh, when, when our parents died, you know, we went to each other. Uh, when my children were born, I think Teller was the, uh, after my wife and I were the first one to see my children. Uh, my children deal with him as though he's a um, family relative. They, they brag about him in, uh, in school. Uh, they, they see him as a relative. So... Uh, Having said that over all these years, there's a certain level that it's not true. Uh, but it starts with respect and then builds from there over time. It doesn't start with that kind of cuddly Lennon-McCartney feeling. <clears throat> Game Lord 12. I remember in one of the early episodes of Bull****, you said that people appear on your show to discuss their side of the topic that you are attempting to debunk because they truly believe they're bulletproof. Out of all the topics you covered on bull****, which is the one that you absolutely cannot believe that they thought what they were doing couldn't be debunked? The what? Oh, yeah. That is the one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the one. No, it's um, uh, chiropractic. You know, uh, chiropractic... Uh, I think a lot of chiropractors uh, believe they're jive. They know, they know it's jive. They know the subluxation is jive. They know they're pulling a scam. But a lot of them don't. Uh, the stuff with chiropractic, the, the stuff that um, they prefer to be called chiropractic, which is why I call it chiropractic, uh, the stuff that uh, has to do with the psychological manipulation the placebo effect. It works on both of them. It works on the, the practitioner and on the patient. And they can fool themselves on that. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, chiropractor, chiropractors are also some of the most unpleasant to us. They uh, treated us badly. Uh, but in a weird way, about one night, about 50 chiropractors came to our show and bought tickets and then announced afterwards, it was this really attractive woman. And she came up to talk to me, and I was really thrilled. And then I realized that she hated me. Uh, <laughs> not the first time that's happened. A very attractive <coughs> woman hating me. And uh, she told us that they were all chiropractors and that uh, they had come to our show that night to tell us they were going to boycott us. Which means not only did the chiropractors not understand chiropractic or medicine, they also had no understanding of a boycott. I don't think we've ever sold 50 tickets to chiropractors in one night. You have to not buy tickets if you're going to boycott. You don't buy tickets and then boycott. Just a little piece of advice if you're planning a boycott, uh, do it right. Uh, there's also were people on the show who uh, didn't believe what they were saying. And I think it's, I think it's important to say that. In my uh, idealism for the way this show was done. Uh, everybody believed it. It was the marketplace of ideas. But when we did the thing with the people going, um, 
down to South America or Mexico. Remember that? Climbing up the pyramid type things. Uh, that they were going to hear voices and stuff. I talked to those people after. You know, I, I wasn't involved with them during the show. We keep separate. But they came to our show and talked to us. And it was very clear they were kind of on our side and just scamming. And, you know, that kind of um, uh, Jerry Springer, Oprah thing happens where people want to get on TV and kind of punk us. And I think several of them did successfully uh, punk us. Um that's okay, you know. We get we get beat now and again, and uh, it was interesting that the creationists, we tore the creationists new, and uh, all they were worried about was how they looked on camera. They 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 wrote us really angry letters that we didn't let them fix their hair enough before they went on, and the angles were unflattering, which isn't true, by the way. We made those creationists look as good as they could fucking look. I mean, the raw material was not there, but it might be a case of a self-image being different. But it was funny how people seem, uh, and I don't know, this says a lot about our culture, I suppose. If Andy Warhol were alive, he'd have a lot to say of it. But many people on our show cared more about being on TV than the information they were talking about. And that's the worst thing I can say about bull because ideally, that would have never happened. Uh, but most of the shows uh, were honest and from the heart, and both sides were speaking honestly and clearly. But once in a while, something slips through. You uh, win-lose, you sum some. Uh, Mr. Eh? Mr. Eh? Has there ever been anything you wanted to do but not allowed to do because it was too controversial? I assume this is about bull too. Um, that's certainly happening on Tell a Lie. On, on the D Discovery show, we, are, we fit in more. You know, Discovery is a science network, and we want to do a science show. And on, uh, on uh, bull we were, they do fiction. They do Dexter. They do great shows that don't do our kind of shows. We threw a lot of nudity at it. We threw a lot of obscenity at it and tried to slide by. But most of the stuff they didn't want us to do was not because it was controversial, but rather because it was too sciencey. The stuff that Discovery will jump at us doing. For instance, uh, we had to fight really hard to do our anti-anti-vaccine show. That was the last show we did. And uh, we fought hard to do it. Now, on Discovery, they love that. You know, they love the stuff that's deeper. They love the stuff that's smarter. We can go with that. But on bullshit, it was always, how can we make it funny? That all having been said, after we did the Bible, after we did Mother Teresa, and after we did the Vatican, bullshit, all three of those, uh, Showtime asked us not to do any more on religion. And it's their network. That's fair. And you would say, you could say we'd done enough on religion, but we hadn't. If we'd been doing the show on our own with no constraints, religion would have come up a different aspect of it, I think, uh, every year. They thought it was enough. That was fine. Uh, fed. They said it was enough. That was fine. They also did not want us to do Scientology. They did not want that done. And I was fine with that. Other people felt that uh, we should have done Scientology. But I believe that everybody knows Scientology is bullshit. Except for the, you know, thousand people that are involved in it. You know, the, the thousand people that are sucked into it. I think everybody else knows it's bullshit. I don't think anyone takes... Did anybody take Travolta and John Cruz's... John Cruz? No, Tom Cruise. His belief in the, that stuff, seriously? Don't they all just kind of go, yeah, great, Tom. Um, I don't know. That's my feeling on it. And also, South Park just went and creamed us. They did a better job on Scientology than we were ever going to do. They did a better job on Mormonism than we could ever do, did a Broadway show on it. And although we are supposed to be the experts on uh, John Edward and we're supposed to know cold reading, we did the best show we could on that, and South Park came in and did a show that was a thousand times better than ours. Uh, there's no reason to watch the bullshit. John Edward, because the South Park on John Edward, just, we can't even see them from where we are. They were so good. Uh, <clears throat> Penn, any government or political backlash on your TSA uh, grabbing blog? That's Karate Explosion that asked this. Karate Explosion. You know, the TSA people, we give out in our show, we sell little metal bill of rights that set off the metal detectors. And, uh, when I go to TSA, I don't know if you get it, but I, I get dirty looks uh, pretty often from people. 
Uh, I also get people that are going, okay, you know, we like your show. They're kind, but I get some hostility. And when I went in and the guy, you know, dra- grabbed my, uh, grabbed my <laughs> and I called the police on him. Um, the sad part is not that, th- I have my stomach growl. The sad part is not that there was government backlash. The sad part was there was, they wanted to treat me special. After I wrote up the blog, and this is not, you know, uh, don't grab my junk. This is back back when it was hard to do. It like 2002 was when I did it, uh, when everybody was still gung-ho on, well, 9-11 happened, so let's grab each other's uh, which I'm all for. That would be a good protest against Islam. But in this case, it was for security, which i totally against airport security. If you want, you can read my uh, Bacon and a Kiss airline, which is well covered in the book. Um, the Heartbreaker, you know, as it's, it's Bob Dylan would say, uh, now is the time for your tears. It's not they treated me badly for that blog. It's that they treated me well. After I wrote the thing about uh, my being grabbed and calling the police in, uh, TSA got in touch with me and asked me if I would just call them before I came to the airport. They would put me through a special line so this wouldn't happen again, which I, that's heartbreaking for them. I will say uh, for myself, I refused any special treatment. I go through the line just like everyone else. I go through the line just like everyone else in first class. <laughs> I don't want to lie. We do go first class, so it's better treatment. But I didn't go to the special, you're making waves, so we'll have you, uh, we'll have you treat. And I don't even know what special treatment they were offering, but it sickened me that because uh, I'm on TV, uh, they were willing to give me special treatment. It's horrible. Um, Although, I'm less likely to be a terrorist, so maybe there is some logic for them. But still, it's that wasn't the reason they were doing it. And I am on TV. I'm on TV with this man here in a show called Pen and Teller Tell a Lie. It's going to be on Discovery, which we call the Disco Channel. Discovery, right after our buddies on Mythbusters who are opening for us. We had our buddies on Mythbusters open for the biggest show on Discovery, which is called Pen and Teller Tell a Lie. There'll be seven or so science stories every week. And one of them is an out-and-out bold-faced lie. There are apps for all your uh, smart devices that will allow you to vote as we go and see if we can fool you with seven unbelievable stories, one of which should not be believed, on Penn & Teller, Tell a Lie on the Discovery Channel. I love doing this Reddit thing. I love these questions. Out of uh, 2,000 those are 10 good ones. Thank you so much for putting me on Reddit. I'm so sorry on my Twitter. I spelt it R-E-A-D. It should be just Reddit. I made a big mistake. I apologize for that. But all our guys, Nate Santucci, all the guys in the crew, my wife, they all read Reddit. They all love it. Most of the stuff I get is from Reddit. So thank you all so much. Please ask us to do this again. Pen and Teller, tell a lie on Discovery, 10 o'clock on Wednesdays.